Okay, I think we are live. I believe. Yes, <laughs> it says live. So, um, hi. <laughs> uh, my name is Catherine Preston. I am one of the programmers for the Philadelphia Film Festival and the Film Society. Um, this year looks really different, but we're so excited you're joining us um, in whatever capacity that may be. And thank you so much for um, checking out White Lie. We love this movie. We're so excited to have it a part of our lineup. And I am so thrilled to welcome Yona Lewis, who is co-director and co-writer of this film. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Catherine. We uh, really, I, I, it's kind of weird. I normally, Kelvin and I are talking together. He seems to be late at the moment. Um, so I'm going to say we accidentally a lot, but really I just mean me. That's okay. Um, thanks, also... uh, thanks for having me. <laughs> thanks for having me, not we. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I will keep an eye out if he does join late, that's no problem. Um, but for the meantime, it is us, so we can get this started. Um, I would love to hear, um, how did how did you decide to tell this story? Like, where did this come from? And, you know, it's such a interesting and bizarre kind of topic. So how did you get there? Yeah, Calvin heard about somebody faking cancer um, and using that diagnosis for financial gain um, in real life uh, about a decade ago. Um, and we were sort of, the two of us were instantly fascinated by some the kind of person who would do this. We, th we thought they were just an absolutely compelling character. And so we started researching a bit and noticed and, and sort of and quickly discovered that it seemed to be a, quite a big phenomenon of people doing this. Um, it was, I mean, it had been a thing for a while, but you know, as, um, the internet, social media, GoFundMe's kind of things, as that um, rose in prominence, uh, it, you know, it sort of exploded. So we, you know, we didn't want to take from one individual person. Um, we just thought that, you know, people doing this were, were so, so interesting, so fascinating that we wanted to, you know, tell a story about them. Um, we, but, it, you know, we didn't exactly know how to um, come about it. We didn't know what the right way to write it was exactly. So it sort of sat in the back burner for a number of years as we worked on other projects. And eventually, I think about 2015, we sat down and really tried to crack it. Um, and, you know, we, we sort of played around a lot with different structures. And that, that was, you know, because we were starting with a character rather than a story, uh, which is sort of unusual for us as writers, there was just a lot of op options that we, you know, a lot of different paths we could go down in terms of what the structure of the film was going to be, you know, the first sort of obvious one was sort of the general rise and fall biopic that you kind of see in a lot of movies. Um, for a number of reasons that didn't excite us. Uh, let me see, maybe I'm getting a text from Calvin. Nope, <laughs> not Calvin. Um, uh, that didn't excite us. And also we knew we were going to be making the movie for not an absurd amount of money. And, you know, we needed to sort of fit it into a sort of more compressed timeline um, from a production standpoint and from a sort of formal structure standpoint. We were interested in that. And so we um, started looking at some films from Europe, from Romania. There's a, a, the uh, Romanian New Wave was a sort of a genre of cinema that came out of um, Romania in the mid 2000s. And a lot of the films, just like um, sort of the Dardenne's, Dardenne Brothers films, the, these kind of dramas, but they have a little bit of a sort of thriller genre um, layer on top of them. And they often take place in a very compressed timeline. And so that was what we decided to sort of incorporate into our own script. And so it became this thing where we, you know, we, we set it over five days um, and that really helped us uh, sort of get into it. And we, you know, we chose to get into it as late as possible and leave as early as possible. And that sort of excited us the most rather than something sort of bigger and sprawling and, you know, giving you a sense of who she was as a, as a child and then who she's going to be, you know, 10, 15 years later. Yeah, I mean, so much of the narrative is really withheld from us as an audience, um, which I, I don't know, for some people, I, I suppose it could be frustrating, but I, I found it worked so well um, with this film because you're just constantly second guessing everything from the very opening shot of the film to the very last shot of the film. We, one, the one thing we knew writing it um, was sort of a, I guess it was a tricky decision was how quickly do we tell the audience that she's taking cancer? Um, and, you know, we grappled with that a little bit at the beginning and initially we were like, oh, maybe we'll hold off a bit later, but we realized that there was no movie if, there was no hook to the movie if you didn't know that she was taking cancer. 
nobody was going to come see the movie if they were like, it's just a movie about someone with cancer. There's got to be something extra, something a little bit juicier to draw people in. So we knew the trailers, the pitch, all of that was a woman's faking cancer. So it's silly to write a script where that's the premise and make it, you wait 45 minutes before the twist role reveals she's actually faking it. So we decided pretty quickly to make sure that that was introduced um, and sort of solidified for the audience you know, 10, within the first 10, 15 minutes. Um, and, and that in a way just, you know, forced us to deal with the fact that she is essentially, you know, what sometimes people describe as an unlikable character. She was, you know, she's a kind of shitty person and doing something pretty awful. Um, but we knew that the whole film was just, you know, her all the way through. So we needed to force the audience to some degree to um, identify with her whether or not they liked her, at least they were identifying with her. And so, um, you know, right out of the gate, you kind of know she's doing something awful. How are you gonna sustain a movie where, you know, you have to follow this person doing something awful, with very little redeeming value in that all the way through. And part of that is just forcing you to be with them the whole way through, you know, um, putting, just sticking with their POV from beginning to end. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, um, <laughs> it sort of frustratingly so puts you, in that uncomfortable position as an audience where you're like rooting for her. Um, and I, I've seen it twice now, once was probably like five months ago at this point, and, and I watched it again today. And it really is this really uncomfortable moral gray area that you are sort of in with her where you're at the same time, right? Like she is kind of a terrible person in a lot of ways, but you're like, I, well, don't get found out. <laughs> like, it's so uncomfortable and you're just so like nervous the whole time. Um, I think we, th th that was something we really wanted to achieve. And I feel like we were actually quite successful with that. There's many things that we wanted to achieve and weren't successful with, but a success that I feel very good talking about is the fact that we wanted you to, you know, at first understand she was doing something bad, but then get roped into, you know, wanting her to succeed. Um, rooting for her, and then once in a while realizing that you're rooting for her and kind of feeling crappy about that, uh, but then getting rooting for her again. And so I feel like from what we've heard from audience members uh, that that seems to be the case. So, you know, we achieved one, at least one thing that we wanted to. So that's great. Yeah, and it's also interesting because, you know, Jennifer as a character um, is so, so sweet, so loving, so supportive, and just sort of... Um, you know, I saw, uh, I think it was at TIFF, I think I saw, uh, I was watching the um, Q&A that you guys had and, you know, she was sort of talking about as a role, you know, Jennifer as a character, sort of describing it, um, likening it to um, being in a relationship with someone who um, has an addiction problem or something, right? And you kind of stick around longer than you possibly should or whatever. But I just, um, I loved that, that their relationship was so, um, seemed so beautifully written and so well sort of um, put together in research, but not like put in the forefront of the film itself. It just was this like beautiful kind of thing that was happening in the background that was also causing this other layer of turmoil. Yeah, I, I think the two of them did a brilliant job of seeming like they were they had a real relationship um, considering how little they actually are together in the movie. They really only have a, a few scenes together and yet they sort of imbued that with a sense of sense of intimacy and sort of pre-existing relationship, they actually met each other the night before they actually they started shooting. Um, Amber's based in London um, and had been on another shoot in Belgium or something. Flew back, dyed her hair some other color, came to here in, in two days and was shooting with us. You know, less than twenty-four hours after getting off of a plane, um, so they met each other. You know seven o'clock one night, we spent a couple hours together eating dinner and rehearsing a few scenes. And then the next morning they were, you know, had to pretend that they'd been in a relationship for a year. Um, that is shocking, honestly. And, and that, and, you know, this is why actors can do things that the rest of us can't sure. uh, and why we all want to watch them. Um, right. You know, we're, Calvin and I are constantly impressed with, you know, working with people who can do these things that we can't even imagine. You know, you, we, to, to do anything on set, we have to spend five years talking about it and planning it and all of the stuff. And, you know, I'm not, not to suggest that they didn't spend a lot of time individually thinking about these things. They didn't have a lot of time together. Um, and yet, you know, they bring this sort of, 
directed them and millions of actors do these things where they just show up on set and suddenly they are surprisingly something you've never seen before. Um, and, and so that was special, but yeah, so, so they met for the first time. There was a lot, it was a small budget movie. We didn't have a lot of time different people in long in advance. Um, Casey was based on the West Coast where we shot here um, in Ontario. And so she flew out. We'd never met her in person before. The very next day after meeting her, you know, she's shaving her head for the movie. So there's all sorts of ways in which everyone's just jumping, you know, headfirst into the film. Yeah, I mean, I, I was going to ask about the casting process. Did a lot of people read for both of both Katie and and Jennifer? Yeah, um, yes, uh, it was a long process. Um, finding, you know, our Katie was tricky. Um, both because of, we needed somebody who was going to be interesting and fascinating and make you like them and hate them at the same time in the way that we were sort of talking about earlier. And, you know, the entire film was going to rest on that one person's shoulders. Um, and at the same time, so we needed, you know, an absolutely brilliant actress, which we think we found Casey. And at the same time, that brilliant actress had to also be willing to shave her head. Um, and that, you know, was a tricky prospect. Um, so it was a long process. I think um, we were in development, sort of trying to raise the funds for the film for a number of years. And the script went across Casey's desk a couple of years, maybe a year or two before we shot. Um, and she had someone in her family had been dealing with cancer and she just was not the right time for her. So I don't even think she read it. She just saw like, you know, cancer movie and was like, I'm, I'm not in this right now. A year later, it came back to her again as, as some funding came in and we were shooting. Um, and she finally read it and was, you know, and I think she, she said she was very, what she said, if she was here now, she, she would say that she was scared by it and that's what made her want to do it. Um, she, the wonderful thing about her was that the idea of shaving her head was something that actually really excited her as well as scaring her. And, you know, for us, it was super important that the actor shave their head because um, we knew it was going to be a huge part of the physicality of the performance. And at the same time, um, there was always this concern that if we had a bald cap or we faked it in some way, not only would it look bad and, you know, that, that that's the first uh, strike against it. Second strike would be that would there be, if, if for a moment you thought she was wearing a bald cap, there'd be some confusion as to whether or not the actor was wearing a bald cap or the character was wearing a bald cap. Um, and that just seemed like a whole kettle fish we wanted to stay away from. So we knew they needed need to shave their head, they need to be a great actor. Um, and eventually after, you know, a great deal of searching, we found Casey. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, I feel like, I'm, I don't want to speak for all women, but I know for me, like, there's definitely like, at some point in my life, I want to shave my head, but there, you know, there's never that like golden ticket, if you will. But no, I think that's um, speaks to the testament of just really diving into the role. And I think you're right that that's not something you can really fake, um, both from the character who was clearly really shaving her head and from a writing standpoint. Um, we do have two audience questions. Oh, look at that. Um, okay, so one is um, what went into your interpretation of an antihero? Um, so we've sort of spoken about this before and it's, just, it's, a, it's an interesting thing that we didn't realize we were gonna be dealing with when we started writing it. And once we started getting some feedback from some funders and people who were reading the script, they were instantly like, she is unlikable. That was the term we got thrown around a lot. Um, and we started thinking about a lot of other movies that had similar sort of anti-hero characters and you know that were beloved by millions of people and that's never been an issue. The thing we realized, and probably we should have realized this earlier, but you know, not always quick as people, um, it was, the difference was that those were all men and she was a woman. So there's a lot more shitty men in cinema who are still, you know, the lead in the film and we're all okay with that. And you know, yes, we don't necessarily like, like them, but we want to watch them in the movie. Whereas there's a lot less of that with women. Um, and so we just kind of had to power through and say, you know, she's going to be interesting. Once, kind of like, trust us, once you see whoever we cast in this eventually, they're going to be so fascinating in this role, you're not going to care that, you know, she's doing this absolutely despicable thing. Um, <laughs> I'm getting text from Calvin. Uh, <laughs> you can still join. What's up? <laughs> uh, um, uh, so the um so that was just really sort of an interesting learning experience for us and um 
And so I think one of the things that we found even that what we were trying to give Casey some references of, you know, of characters from other movies so just to be thinking about, you know, if she, and we, we, we ended up sending her a whole bunch of movies and the, all the people were men. You know, we sent her like Brad Pitt and Moneyball as sort of a character, you know, who, and, you know, in, in no way is he a similar person to her, but there was sort of an energy to that role that was similar to what we wanted with her. But almost always in cinema, we were only able to see men playing characters like this. Um, there's certainly occasionally women, you know, but uh, but considerably fewer. Sure. Um, and then the other question was, um, as one of the people who wrote and created Katie, do you sympathize with her? Um, yeah, yes. Um, I think I do to some degree, which in that I've, you know, painted myself into a corner once or twice in my life with small lies. Um, I, you know, I, I would like to believe I've never done anything as despicable and huge as this. Um, but I'm certainly sympathetic to that feeling of realizing you've, you know, you've just said a little white lie in a way that, you know, complicates your life and forces you either to lie more or to fess up to it and, you know, sort of just move past it. Um, so, uh, you know, I think she's a truly, you know, I think that she's doing truly awful things. I also think she's just a pretty fucked up person. Um, and I understand that, you know, a lot of people who do bad things are coming from complicated situations. Um, you know, I've, I've experienced a great deal of cancer in my life. I think, you know, the idea of someone faking that is awful. Um, but that's kind of why, you know, we want to spend time with somebody doing this you know, for 90 minutes or for us really for five years. We have a Calvin Thomas. Oh, we got him for the last question. <laughs> you got to turn on your sound, Calvin. Oh, oh. I just unmuted him. Oh. Okay. Hi. Am I there? You're here. Hi, Calvin. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. I'm here. Hi. <laughs> You're here. No, we're so uh, excited you, to have you. Is it COVID time? Were you asleep? <laughs> it is past my bedtime, to be honest. But, uh, <laughs> Yes, I apologize deeply. No, no, it's Sorry. fine. It's uh, I was saying before we even went live, like it's funny because it's opening night of our festival, but you know, I'm at home. It's now 10 past 1030 at night and it feels so late, but normally opening night of a festival, it's like, well, what's next? What are we doing? What are, what's the game plan? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But um, we, we had some answers to uh, questions from the audience that we just were asked. So look at that. You were sorry to put you on the spot. Uh, no, I, I mean, I answered them all brilliantly. So. <laughs> I can attest to that. <laughs> um, but no, we, we, we've, we've just been talking about, you know, um, creating this anti-hero and um, sort of this dubious moral path that she's on that we're sort of thrust into as well as the audience. Um, a question was asked if you uh, sympathize with Katie. Um, so no. that's... Yeah, no the same it, 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 I feel like his answer is uh, <laughs> well something I think is so interesting and now that you're here I can ask this question you two have been obviously working together for um, a really long time now um, and um, I read in an interview you were saying like you know if I make a decision if he makes a decision it's sort of like we're both making the same you're so like on the same page like how how what is that collaboration like between you two that's so successful how does that work yeah, I think it is a question we get asked a lot because I think traditionally a director is seen as it's this very singular vision and it is sort of a single person that is leading, uh, you know, the vision or, or a crew. Um, but we've been working together for 14 years now. I think it was 14 years in the spring. And I think when you start an art form or a career or a collaboration, whatever that is, very early, um, when you're sort of both like sponges and you're absorbing and you're learning everything. If you do that with someone, the way that you work together, the way you learn together, the way you discuss together um, becomes very intuitive. And so when we first started working in film school, we made terrible movies and we didn't know what we liked and we didn't know what we wanted to do. And so when you develop your language for film, when you develop your interest for film, um, when you develop your interest in how to make film or the tools to make films. When you do that together, 
it, it's very hard to sort of disengage from that. So, um, so it's very intuitive, and I think we we have very similar instincts, although we challenge each other on on things occasionally. But it's always for the same goal, and we both want to make the same movie at the end of the day. So that's very important. I think the thing that you're always aware of when there's two people to essentially give one answer when you have a crew of 35 36 people and in white lie we had a 31 speaking roles you don't want to have any wires crossed so that if a crew member comes up and asks yono a question or asks me a question you want that answer to be relatively the same and you don't want to be confusing people whether it's a cast member or it's a crew member so on this film, this is the biggest crew that we've ever had. It's certainly the biggest film and the, the most ambitious film that we've done. So we knew we had to be super, super prepared. And so to avoid any kind of, basically any decision that hadn't been talked about or thought about, we needed to make sure that we were very well prepared for that. So we did a lot of work in preparation for making the film in order to be on the same page. And that didn't mean that we couldn't be spontaneous and that ideas can come up on the day, but we essentially were on the same page. We knew what each scene was about. We knew which each moment needed to be. Um, and so I, I think a lot of that work came from, from the prep um, so that, yeah, we didn't have these embarrassing moments on set where one person said one thing and the other person said another and, you know, crew was going this way or that way. It, it would have been embarrassing if we, you know, did that. So we, we did everything we could to nip that in the bud. Uh, we have another audience question. Um, did you write the film with the idea that the audience wants Katie to redeem herself? Um, no, I don't think so. I, I think, I don't know if people in real life usually want to redeem themselves. I think that's more of a movie character trait. Um, I think we knew we wanted, I think she wants to get herself out of the situation. Um, I don't think she, I think we wrote it with in mind, with, with the idea that she doesn't believe she's doing anything wrong. Um, you know, with, it's a fairly common thing in movies where you're like, oh, you know, you want to make sure that the villain is, um, when, when actors are talking about playing a villain in a movie, they're often talking about how they need to think about it as if that person is not the villain, as if they're the hero of their own story. And so, that's certainly how we thought about her when we were writing her, um, which, you know, we're just trying to think about her as if she was us. Um, and, you know, we all create pretty big stories in our mind about how we're always in the right. Um, and so I don't think that she wants to redeem herself. I think she just wants to not get caught and get away with it and, you know, achieve everything she's ever dreamed of achieving. Um, I, I think the movie takes place over such a short period of time too, that oftentimes, I think about a moment where I've made a mistake and of course I haven't done anything remotely like what Katie did in the film and I that's not what I said earlier <laughs> I could not handle the stress of that of course but but when you when you make a mistake and you feel horrible about that you're all, all you can be focused on are the immediate things that make you feel better or that try to try to make you look better in the moment and then maybe it's a day later a week later where you're like oh with a clear head I made a mistake and now I'm going to own that mistake. That's the way a lot of people deal with uh, problems in a, in a logical way. So I think if the movie took place over a longer period of time, White Lie only takes place over five days, if we decided to make the film take place over those five days, but then also show a month later, then maybe there would be room to show that aspect of, of Katie. But um, I think the, the way we chose to structure it in a very short period of time um, doesn't allow for that. And so I think, the challenge is to have snippets of that, you know, so we made sure that she had a moment where she was aware of the trouble that she was in, uh, asking the doctor towards the end of the film, how can I get out of this? I want to find a path. She still wants to be in control of that path of getting out of it. Um, so I think there's moments where in a very short timeline that the film takes place over, you try to get little hints of that in, but um, you know, if we think about her character beyond the film, yes, maybe there's a moment where she's looking for redemption, but certainly not within the five days. That yeah. in, in the heat of the moment, she's just trying to survive, I think. Right, but I mean, the decision to actually have her sort of kind of come clean to Jennifer at the very, very end. 
Yeah. Not, not that that's seeking redemption by any means, but it is sort of like this final, like, <sighs> like. Yeah, I mean, that is certainly, you know, it's nice to get things off your chest. Um, you know, keeping a lie, like keeping a very small lie can, um, can be incredibly stressful. And I can only imagine what it would be like um, keeping up a lie of this magnitude. So I'm sure, you know, part of her just wanted to be done with it, but part of her also just hoped that if she came clean in some way, they would be able to move past it together, um, which, you know, is a somewhat foolish idea, in our opinion. I agree. <laughs> yeah. um, so we do have to wrap up soon, but um, I am so curious. I, I love the score for this film so much. Um, and so I would love to hear about um, Lev Lewis, who is your younger brother, Yona. Um, he's collaborated with you guys. Am I correct on every project you've worked on in some capacity? Um, I think that's so interesting. I would love to hear, um, you know, you don't have to make it super general, but in this for White Lie in particular, um, he edited the film, he, he did the score, and it's such an interesting um, kind of jarring score in a lot of ways. But um, yeah, I would love to hear about that collaborative process with him. Yeah, really the three of us are sort of, um, uh, I mean, we have a company together, we work very closely. He works in a, you know, incredibly closely on all of our projects and we work on his. He's also a, um, a director and writer in his own right, so we produce his films. Um, the, it, you know, we, we, we just like Calvin was talking about earlier, we sort of grew up learning what film was together and he was a part of that. Um, so he acts as editor and composer on, all our films now, his sort of evolution as what his um, as to what his exact role in sort of changed over time, but um, but he's our editor and composer, and he's also sort of the first first person who reads our scripts. So uh, he's right, he's there right from the beginning. Um, you know, we find it incredibly beneficial to have um, a third set of eyes, just you know, a, a tiebreaker and a vote, and um, a and somebody who's you know there from the ground up and sort of understands everything that we're trying to do. Um, he's also editing the film as we go, uh, as we're shooting. Uh, so he's able to give us notes and help us figure out what we're doing stupidly, um, you know, so that we can fix it for the next day. Uh, so he's really there from the beginning to the end. The, writing the score for this film, I think was an interesting process. It went through a number of variations, sort of iterations. Um, I think there was even a moment where we discussed not having any score at all. So the film sort of had that sort of handheld down and dirty scoreless verite kind of vibe in the script. That was never exactly how we envisioned it, but some, certainly some people reading it read it that way. Um, so we, we, but we always knew we wanted to have some score, you know, it's a fairly integral part of a lot of films we think and you know, why not utilize it. Um, but finding the balance sort of between the dramatic, the thriller, the horror, all of those kind of things and not veering into any one of them too much in the score, I think was a, was a tricky process, but, um, but we really love the score and we think he captured sort of the exact uneasy feeling that we were looking for. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Calvin. Yeah, I think, I mean, to your point about thinking about the movie without score, I think before we made the film, that was very much in our head based upon the reference. Yeah. Uh, we were looking at and thinking about for the screenplay. So, so that we, there was a score was a big question mark. And then I think in we do a, we do a fair we did a fair number of rough screenings, uh, rough cut screenings. Maybe there was two sort of significant ones, both of which had temp score, which Lev had just created on a computer. And I think we had a lot of notes where people couldn't really articulate why they didn't like the the temp music that we had in but there was something that was rubbing them the wrong way. And I think it was a bit heavier. It was a bit more guitar heavy. It was a tiny bit more aggressive. And, you know, Lev had a week to compose the actual score to finally be like, okay, you have to write this music. We have a week to, for, for you to prep it and then, and then record it. And whatever it was, wh whether it was sort of feedback from those test screenings or just sort of finally understanding what the movie was, each piece that he presented us to, be, to us being like, is this the final one? Does this feel good? Really, really landed. And I think he just found that tone. I remember early on telling him that we wanted some kind of sense that the music should feel like there's this sense of uh, uneasiness or, or sort of off kilter where constantly you, the audience should feel slightly off balance. Um, and I know nothing about 
music. So th th that's the only note that we can give Lev and say, hopefully he in internalizes that in some way. Um, but yeah, the actual, the score that's actually heard in the film, I think came together very, very uh, quickly, but, but after many months of sort of scratching our heads as to, to what was the right choice. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I was saying earlier to Calvin, or sorry, to Yona, that um, I rewatched the movie after I think it's been about five months since I saw it last. Um, and I, I, I was almost more uneasy this time for some reason, <laughs> knowing what was sorry. happening. It just, <laughs> in the best way possible, of course. Um, but yeah, the score um, was such an amazing compliment to. Um, everything else that's going on. And it's so interesting to learn that it was done so quickly because you know the movie itself happens in five days, as you said. So it's just this sense of like urgency and um, yeah, it just came together in such a tense, wonderful way. <laughs> <laughs> tense and wonderful. I'll, I'll let him know you said that. You know, you know, occasionally sends uh, Lev and I in a group thread uh, letterbox reviews, many of which just say, what a horrible experience. I never want to watch this again, but it's like a four star rating. So they liked the movie, but, but it, it obviously was incredibly stressful and, and uh, intense for them. I, I enjoy receiving those. Uh, yeah, well, I sent you a good one yesterday. It was a, a horrible, oh no, I loved the movie. I'll never watch it again. I think yeah. it was one I just read, which was good. And I was like, all right, great. I get that. Fair enough. That's how I feel, that's how I feel about it. I don't really want to have to watch the movie again myself. <laughs> Well, Yona and Calvin, thank you so much for, for joining me. Um, this has been such a pleasure. Um, as I said, we're so excited to have White Lie in our festival this year. I'm such a huge fan. And um, thank you to our audience who has been tuning in. And thank you for the questions. And um, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their evening. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for having us, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>